Hey friends, and welcome to The World Transformed. This week we're talking about transformation today. We're talking about headlines in the news that speak to an amazing future that is arriving a little bit sooner than some of us may have expected. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. Happy Friday. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm great. Got to the Friday, but uh, hey, this is, this is exciting news here that we're looking at. Modified brainwaves, in particular, this story, the first story we're looking at here is uh, regarding Alzheimer's, right? That's exactly right. We ended the show last time. We were talking about how artificial intelligence might play a role in helping our lives to last a little bit longer. And now we've got something even wackier sounding, how flashing lights and pink noise might banish Alzheimer's, improve memory, and more. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this story here. In March 2015, Li Hui Tsai set up a tiny disco, this is our researcher, set up a tiny disco for some of the mice in her laboratory. For an hour each day, she placed them in a box lit only by a flickering strobe. The mice, which had been engineered to produce plaques of the peptide amyloid beta in the brain, a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, crawled about curiously. When Tsai later dissected them, those that had been to the mini dance parties had significantly lower levels of plaque than mice that had spent the same time in the dark. Okay, so we're always looking for interesting new treatments to make our lives longer, to make our lives better, to make ourselves healthier. Would you have guessed, would anyone have guessed, that being exposed to a strobe light might actually help prevent Alzheimer's disease? That sounds very unlikely, and yet that is the gist of this research. Basically, what they're doing is they're training these mice brains to operate at a different wavelength, right? You're introducing a brain wave into the brain externally from an external source without using electrodes, without actually pumping electricity into the brain. And just that altered brain activity is sufficient to significantly reduce the damage that a neurodegenerative disease, a progressive disease like Alzheimer's might do. And in fact, it can prevent the beginnings of that disease from occurring. A non-intrusive path into the brain. What do you think of that, Stephen? You could laughingly suggest that, you know, getting your boogie on is always a good idea, right? Always. Uh, there you go. Go mice. Uh, Disco mice. In, yeah, yeah, mice and people, every, everything, right? But yeah. I, I think it may come down to this, that these mice are being given, uh, given a different stimulus, and therefore it's something new to them that they got to kind of figure out, right? And in doing so, it's, it encourages growth of neurons or, or you know, a, re a rewiring of the brain in some way. It's the sort of thing doctors will tell Alzheimer's patients often that, you know, it might be good to take up a new hobby, try something new that you've never done before to give yourself a different experience. And, uh, the, and the reasons for this is that it, it kind of will allow you to uh, maybe rewire your brain in a, little, in, a, in a slightly different way. So maybe that's one, one thing that uh, doctors may have been doing for a while with Alzheimer's patients is uh, analogous to what's going on with these mice, perhaps. That's very interesting. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And you have to wonder, when you see a research like this, how much is it that the external stimulus is reprogramming the brain? And how much is it simply that the novel experience is allowing the patient to reprogram its brain? In this case, the mouse is the patient, right. the subject of, of, of the test. Because to your point... This is one of the things doctors recommend. I don't know what the clinical studies on that have been, but it almost seems it seems almost like common sense. If your if your brain is degenerating, do what you can to stimulate your brain. Do what you can to make it to get it out of its rut, right? To get it to the point where it's sufficiently stimulated that it's generating new activity and it's you would think better resisting this disease that it's a follow up experiment that I would suggest if I were talking to this researcher is. Try other weird things with the mice. Give them other weird experiences besides strobe lights and see if it's any different. Give them a little pool party, right? You know, just a little slides. And, you know, I don't know. Come up with something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no end to the interesting stimuli you can provide to mice. That's for sure. I think they can, they, they, they can try a lot of different things. Now, we haven't read the original research. Obviously, we're going on a press account here. Presumably, there were controls used. And presumably, there are reasons to believe that in addition to that, it's not a placebo effect, but it's, it's kind of a different effective ingredient, basically, in the treatment than what the researcher is claiming here. 
In addition to that, apparently there's good reason to believe that they actually are operating directly on the brain waves here. And let's hope. Let's hope that they actually have found that way in because that speaks to a lot of things above and beyond treating Alzheimer's. Although I don't want to leave that one behind because if you could just fix one thing with external stimuli to the brain, I'm guessing, I'm thinking that's the one I would pick, right? Any, any kind of uh, disease that uh, causes dementia, you know, let's, not, a, not a bad thing to hit, right? That's, that's right. If there's a treatment for the brain and you're given the choice, you say, this will only ever be able to do one thing. What would you like to do? I, I think I'd say, yeah, let's prevent Alzheimer's. That's, that would be a, a sufficient justification for doing research into, into something like this. And I would be perfectly content if, if, that was, if that was the one and only implication of this. But it's really, it's really not. If it turns out this is true, if it turns out that these external stimuli really can change the frequency at which the brain is operating, then there is a wide, wide set of possibilities for treatments like this. They can be used for a lot of different things. If you've read about, and I know we've talked about it in the past, it's been a while since we talked about it, there was this whole kind of binaural beats phenomenon a few years ago where people were sticking headphones on and they got one tone coming into one ear, they've got another tone coming into the other ear, and word was that between those two, those two kind of competing tones, your brain was being made to oscillate at a particular at a particular frequency, and the result of that was various benefits depending on what frequency it was it was vibrating at. You might be given an elevated mood, you might be given a more relaxed mood, you might be given greater focus. All kinds of wonderful potential benefits. Now, have you ever tried those, Stephen? I have not. I have not. Have you? I have tried them, and I found them not to really do much of anything. Okay, in my own case. And it could be that maybe I didn't have sufficiently good headphones. Maybe I wasn't accessing the really good binaural beats programs. I mean, there's, there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of potential excuses you could make there. But for me, anyway, it didn't actually do anything. But the, the idea is so intriguing because we know that you can do a lot to a brain if you cut open a head and start <laughs> messing around with it with a knife, you know, or even if you stick wires in, you can stimulate the pleasure centers, you can stimulate the different parts of the brain, but those are all very intrusive and very high-risk activities. And we don't know of a direct way, for example, to open up a person's head and prevent Alzheimer's. We don't know of a direct way to open up somebody's head and increase their intelligence. And actually, it's probably just as well that we don't know of even a minimally effective way to open up somebody's head and increase their intelligence. Otherwise, people would be doing it, right? And that would be an awfully high-risk kind of a thing to be trying to do. But what if you could make these? We already have six input channels, right? I mean, that's right. Touch, touch, uh, smell, uh, hearing, uh, sight. You know, I mean, it's we could try some of these things, right? And and uh, do input that way. That would be a whole lot less intrusive, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I, to to your earlier point, we know that new experiences in our lives, and basically just the experiences we have in our lives, are programming our brains all the time, anyway. We know that. We know right. that physiological changes occur in our brain when we learn something new, when we take on a new behavior, when a traumatic experience occurs. All of these things actually change the structure of our brain. So we know external stimuli can change our brain. The question is, to what extent? What other effects might be possible? Is it possible down the road that we can use strobe lights and aural oscillations, sound and light, to treat depression, to help people to sleep better, to make people more confident? You know, to make people feel euphoria or to make them feel enlightenment. Basically, a lot of things that can be done now chemically, is it possible that those could be achieved just by getting the brain into the right state, right? Is, are there external stimuli that could provide that? Now, there is no research that I know of that suggests that that, that could occur. However, this research mildly suggests that it could. It, to, to me, it's, it says, yes, you can, you can go in and you can make a brain different by showing it light and by giving it sound. And to me, that opens up a whole new world of how we might start programming our brain. So I'm really interested to see where research like this goes. But to swing it back around, it, again, if it has no benefits other than the one that's described here, and this actually works, it's completely worth it, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, Phil, it's been a huge week this week, and uh, we've we got another week planned for next uh, that's going to be great as well. 
And, Next uh, week, we're going to be talking about some of our core world transforming ideas and we're going to take on a big area we're going to talk about possibility we haven't done a show about that in a while we're going to talk about the adjacent possible the deep possible and the hidden possible so we hope you will all join us for that it's been great talking with you and until next time live to see it 